I wasn't yours. I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going, I'm going back, I'm going, I'm going back to who I was before. Hey guys and welcome and or welcome back to my channel. Okay, I know it's supposed to be makeup and true crime, but it's Father's Day and one, I don't have makeup. It was just a lot going on. And two, if you follow me on the gram or TikTok, baby, after building that gazebo and being outside in the sun, um, I probably don't even have a foundation that matches right now. The girl got a little tan on her. And um, I didn't want like too long to go by because like they've already had a whole nother week of testimony and I just wanted to give you guys a recap so next one y'all y'all get where I'm going here but if you guys caught the first video that I posted I'm here to give you an update on what is going on in Karen's case let's go so I am pretty much caught up on testimony I am missing I think day 25 um I took notes for y'all made sure you know I got everything dot my eyes um so when we left off i was talking about an agent i think i might have called him an fbi agent in that video but he's actually an atf agent and i believe with everything going on right now they've kind of you know what um like when cops mess up they put them on uh, like desk duty stuff like that like he's kind of been relieved of his duties for now for right now but like they haven't fired him right but um Let's go back to that man, okay? So he is an ATF agent, so he is, you know, somehow involved with law enforcement. I was telling y'all in the last video that he was exchanging like flirty texts with Karen. Baby, I, t I think I told y'all since I was rushing to go out that day that I didn't like fully finish his day. Baby, it wasn't just flirty texts, okay? So what had happened was, he was actually at John's house. John, let's remember, John is the officer who this trial is over. He was found uh, in the snow in front of the house and now they are uh, trying Karen for murder. Can I say that on this app? Cause that, I mean, I just, that came out real strong. Um, they are trying Karen saying that she is the one responsible for it. So this ATF agent was at John's house. Okay, and after, uh, when he was getting ready to leave that night, I guess Karen followed him out, so somehow it was just him and Karen. Karen kissed him. A little peck, a little, little smooch. And that is how that uh, text exchange started between the two of them, right? They're texting each other, he's like, baby, what was that? And she's like, what do you think it was? It, it was what it was. So they are now exchanging 40 text messages, you know, like, and they're they're talking like high schoolers. Like this, this can't be people who are like 40, 50 talking like this. But anyway, it's like, well, I like you too. And I like you too. And I like, and I, and I, uh, uh. so um, like they're exchanging texts like, oh, well, you know, if you had stuck around, we could have found a place to, to you know what, all of that type stuff, right? And in the text messages, he keeps repeatedly trying to get Karen to say like, where are you going with this, right? He's like, I thought you were happy in your relationship. Are you not happy in your relationship? Well, what do you want from this? You know, where is this going? And she is, baby, when I tell you, Karen, she 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 had some type of training for men, okay? Because the way she was dodging them questions and the way like she, you could not get a real answer out of her, it'd be like, so you know, like, what do you want out of this? Whatever life brings it. But, like she was, baby, you are not going to get me caught up if for some reason John were to ever see these text messages. Now, we'll discuss at another time what Karen's character behind that because I don't like a cheater, man or a woman. But, um, she made sure like she she kept him on his toes with what she wants out of this but they definitely did say like if they had been able to find a place or if they could meet up so that they could you know adult wrestle they definitely would have done that right so like these messages are coming in hot and heavy and then all of a sudden karen just kind of stops talking to the agent like she just kind of ghosts him um so you know he like messages her and he's like well hello to you too and she's like hey like it was just very random how was she just kind of like I'm, I'm cool off this type of vibe for that right so he texts her and um he's kind of giving the impression like you know all of that for what like where are we going with this and she said something like well the phone works both ways you see what i'm saying where i said like she got that she got that dog in there <laughs> um not funny so fast forward to the night that all of this happens with john right remember i told you karen and john went out to a bar and uh, they ran into other people that they knew and that's how they ended up getting the invitation to go back to the sister's brother's house which is the house owned by a police officer all that stuff so while they were out 
John and Karen actually end up showing up at a place that the uh, that the agent is at. I think it's the second place that Karen and John went to when they got there. Um, the agent was there, right? So the agent actually is greeted by John, you know, because in John's mind, they're friends. All of these people are friends. They all work in law enforcement. So, and I would assume John doesn't really know anything yet. I, I actually, from other stuff that maybe John did know, but um, he is greeted by John. He is not greeted by Karen. And the defense attorney actually makes a point to point that out. He's like, do you know what the term ghosted means i said i know you right um he asked the agent do you know what the term ghosted means and the agent says you know like i'm familiar with that and he was like you felt some type of way that you were ghosted by karen didn't you and he was like i wasn't i wouldn't say that i was ghosted and he was like she stopped talking to you didn't didn't she and he was like you know until the 29th and he was like but the 29th so basically she kind of stopped talking to him and the next time that she did talk to him was on the day that john was found deceased and she's texting him to tell him that john is deceased right and he's like i'm gonna talk about that i'm talking about that hot and heavy conversation that you guys were having it fizzled out very quickly and she stopped talking to you you felt some type of way that she ghosted you right and he's like no i wouldn't say that he also tried to say that he wouldn't say that you know he was romantically interested in karen but like those text messages say otherwise but that night when they were all in the same room karen did not speak to him so as you guys know uh they left the bars that they were bar hopping around and everyone was supposed to go back to the house owned by the police officer so this agent they have text messages where he is texting John and he's saying, so where are you at? Where are you at? Are you coming? Are you coming? In sounds, sounds to me like they were supposed to meet up at the house. And you know what it sounds like to a lot of other people? It sounds like y'all were going to meet up at that house because either you told John or John found out or somehow, but it sounds like y'all were going to meet up. Y'all know what it is when like people are arguing and stuff like that and they're supposed to meet up at certain places and figure the situation out that's what those text messages were giving when you were texting john but as we know everyone is alleging john never actually made it into that house so he claims that he went to the house and then um you know socialized and then he did not go home after he left the home that all of this went down on he actually went back to the police station um he claims that he went back there to move the work vehicles around so he was in his personal vehicle his personal vehicle also has a plow attached to it it's a jeep um and then after that he went back to the police station moved work vehicles around and then he went home so he claims he went home had some more food had another drink or two and then he just like crashed out for the night and he says he did not wake up until he got a text message at 7 a.m telling him that you know john's body was found so we're gonna move over to the defense team talking now and the defense questions you know you, you said you came home uh pretty much like passed out after eating and a little more beers or two and then you went to sleep until 7 a.m but there's a text message that you got from the homeowner where this happened. You got a text message from the homeowner at 2.22 a.m. That was just one second. I, I don't believe it shows that he answered the phone. It was just a one second phone call at 2.22. But 17 seconds later, it shows your phone number called that number back. And there was a 22 second long conversation uh, from your number to the number of the person who owns the home remember when i told y'all i hate a liar i hate a liar and if you're going to be a liar be a good one y'all want to know how he explained why his phone called that phone number back at two well 17 seconds later from 221 so that's what 239 i'm doing math real quick in my head right now he said his phone must have butt dialed the other phone back and that's how there's that 22 second long conversation if you have an iphone how does your phone butt dial another phone without anyone touching it because remember he claims he's asleep 
this entire time that this is happening. So, and he lives alone. So no one else is touching the phone. If the phone is just stationary like that, how does your phone butt dial a number back that called it? And mind you, like the butt dialing was a very common thing with these people. When they were asking the sister-in-law, like why she had so many phone calls to John's phone, which people are alleging that she made so many phone calls because they were trying to find John's phone after all of this happened. That's alleged. Um, well, that's a conspiracy. Um, she was like, oh, well, her phone must have been butt dialing John's phone. And that's why she has a, but like the calls were back to back to back to back. So to butt dial the phone, and then you notice that it's butt dialing, you have to hang up for it to be able to butt dial again. And it's like, everybody's butt is butt dialing someone else's butt. Y'all's butts must be doing that Tyla's water challenge with all the, the jiggling and manipulation going on with these phones. Oh wait, one more thing. So remember I said that the phone call from the homeowner to the agent was at 2.22 and then 17 seconds later, at least phone logs show that he, the agent called the homeowner back 17 seconds later. All of this is about like five minutes before the sister-in-law had Googled how long does it take for a body to die in the cold? But remember she claimed she never made that Google search at 2 a.m but you're calling the agent about five minutes before that search is done. Everybody is awake. Everyone claims that they're sleeping. Everyone claims that they weren't there, but it seems like at least phone records are saying everybody is awake during this time. But anyway, um, but that's his story and he's sticking to it, right? Even though uh, the defense attorney brings up later on that he testified somewhere else, maybe in front of a grand jury, but wherever he testified previously, that he actually did have a conversation with um, the homeowner. But when he brings that question up, the state objects and uh, it is uh, sustained. So he doesn't actually have to answer that question of whether or not he, um, he said yes later on that he actually did have a conversation with the homeowner. And we'll get into the judge's sustained and objections later on. But according to him, he doesn't wake up until 7 a.m. And like that's when his day at the police station you know gets started because he spent like a majority of the day at the police station after john's body is found okay so fast forward now it's daytime we're still talking about this agent um he is pretty much at the police station where they're handling at least you know bringing the car in and all that stuff he's there pretty much all day and you know um when you're walking around these stations and you you're an employee there they give you these uh, keys to access certain areas and they log at what time you're there, right? So he's kind of logging in and out of certain places throughout the entire day, but he logs in going into the Sally port. If you guys remember, I said that's like a kind of like a garage type thing that they have attached to these stations where they will, you know, uh, look at larger evidence like a car or like they transport, you know, um, prisoners, stuff like that through the Sally port. So his key logs that he's in the sally port before karen's car arrives to the station but like it never logs when he leaves the sally port and also the footage from him going into the sally port is missing no one sees it no one has it so once again he is an agent um he works in law enforcement so now the defense is questioning him on one of the days well not one of the days but on a day it, he contacts his best friend who was also an ATF agent and he is basically asking his friend to, to show him how does he extract text messages from his phone that he chooses like how can I go through my phone um, my phone text messages and take the text messages that I want so I can hand them over to law enforcement so the best friend shows him and um, that's what he does he picks out the text messages that he feels um, are important for law enforcement to see and then he hands them over to law enforcement. Now her defense attorney does say, wouldn't it be easier to just hand over your phone so that the so that you are not the person determining what text messages uh, they should see. They just have access to everything, right? Especially like if you have nothing to hide, you just turn over the entire phone. And he was like, yeah, that was an option, but that's not the option that I took. I decided to pick which text messages uh i was going to provide to them now i did not mention the fact that he is called as a witness uh by the state 
you know, he is not being looked at as a criminal for anything going on in this investigation. He came to court that day with his attorney. So before any more questions um, go on, they actually bring his attorney up for this next set of questions because basically her defense attorney is asking him, are you aware that you going to, you know, a federal building and using a federal machine by attaching your phone to this machine to take the text messages that you want and having your friend teach you how to do it when this situation that you're taking the text messages out for has nothing to do with a case that you're working on or a case that your friend is working on are you aware that's a crime it's actually a felony one thing about it when you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing if god don't get you that way he gonna get you in another way because you pretty much just admitted to committing a felony because you can't use federal you know uh machinery stuff like that for your own personal gain and that's what you were doing because like he said it had nothing to do with any case that you were actually investigating so that's why they brought up um his lawyer i think like one question about that might have been able to be answered but then the other questions the state uh, objected and again it was sustained and one last thing before they wrapped up with the atf agent the defense attorney is asking him questions about what he did with his phone because him and a couple other people involved i'm not sure if i said it in the previous video that i uploaded but i know i mentioned it in the comments um they destroyed their phones they got rid of their phones. like everybody got a new phone at the same time um and he is one of them he is someone who got rid of his phone he said you know that's my right to you know y'all get real defensive like all right calm down calm down um he was like that's his right to get rid of his phone all of that stuff however they had been served with like some type of paperwork pretty much saying that like you cannot uh destroy the phone however they got rid of the phones like a day before they were actually served with the paper now again alleged conspiracy is saying you would have to have some someone on the inside letting you know that this paperwork is coming for you to know to get rid of it a day so he's basically saying you know you picked out whatever text messages that you wanted to pick out instead of handing over your phone because you knew you were going to destroy your phone and you knew that it would be a lot easier for investigators to have the actual phone itself so did you take out the sim card and destroy it and then dispose of the sim card and dispose of the phone this man looks at the judge and says i don't recall if i took the sim card out but if i did if I did take the SIM card out of the phone, I would have made sure I broke it or cut it up and then disposed of it and then disposed of the phone. And that's the end of the testimony for that day. Okay, so now we kind of start to move away from people that were either in the house or some way connected, a niece, a cousin, a sister-in-law. We're moving away from them and we're moving towards people who are now investigating this case, right? Actually, we're talking about some of the main investigators. Now, this next person I'm talking about is not the actual lead investigator. He's his supervisor. He's one of his supervisors. And he takes a stand very early on in his testimony. He's talking about the fact that the, so, you know, Karen and John went out the night of, so the day of this situation going on, one of the first few things he says is that Karen and John got into a fight over what John chooses to feed his niece and nephew. So uh, apparently John's sister had passed away. So John took over being the caretaker for his niece and nephew. If you hear talking in the background, I did mention it's Father's Day, so that's my family in the background. So John is taking care of his niece and nephew. And like, these, I don't believe these are like children, children. It sounds like they're teenagers, but he makes it a point to point out that Karen is upset with what John is choosing to feed his niece and nephew, but they still end up going out that night to have drinks. So they are going through footage showing them at the bar and he is counting out like how many drinks Karen has had, right? Like, oh, that's drink one, that's drink two, that's drink three. But what's noticeable is that when they leave, all he mentions is the fact that John is the one who leaves with a glass from the bar and that glass is going to come back into play. So now they're examining the video of Karen's car being brought into the Sally port for them to examine it, right? So they actually went to Karen's home to get it. I think they also showed video of that as well um, and that's also going to come into play. But they are looking at the video of Karen's car and he's testifying, he's saying, you know, that is me. You know, this person over there is the lead investigator. This person is the tow truck driver. He's very specific 
specific and he very much so is aware of who was who and who was who right so of course now it's time for the defense to cross-examine and what comes up through cross-examination is actually that the video that the courtroom is watching is inverted so look at it this way when so before it's known to the court that the video is is inverted if you are watching the video it would appear to you that you're looking at the passenger door right you're watching someone get out of the passenger door in the video but the video is inverted so what you're actually looking at is someone getting out of the driver's side of the car now why does it matter that the video was inverted well in the correct view of the video so right not the inverted version the lead investigator gets out of the car and he goes over to the side of the car where the right tail light is now remember they are saying karen you know this man by hitting him with her car and the damage was to her right tail light so in the correct version of the video the lead investigator is some somewhere around the right side of the car but if the video appears inverted then you would think he got out of the video he got out of the car and he went somewhere towards the driver's side tail light so that's why it matters to know that the video is inverted because i believe they asked him something like did the lead investigator go anywhere near the right tail light of the car and they said no and if you're watching the video you would think no he goes to the driver's side tail light but the video was inverted he actually went to the right the passenger side tail light which is on the right side of the car the tail light is one of the most important things in this case because that's pretty much all the evidence that they have are the broken pieces of the tail light and did i mention the broken pieces of the tail light they didn't find uh at the at the scene where all of this happened like right away they found the pieces like day by day, right? Like, so so people just happened to be driving past the situation and they would see more and more red pieces of broken taillight on the ground. Now, I am no investigator, but wouldn't you, if you are investigating a crime scene, wouldn't you make sure like you do everything that you can to find all the pieces the, the day that it happens, the day, that you are initially conducting this investigation which keep in mind um the day of when they were you know outside looking for pieces of the tail light they used a leaf blower again i'm no investigator but i feel like that probably isn't the best uh decision especially because is, isn't it going to move evidence around and isn't part of the point that evidence stays as intact as it possibly can and you where you find evidence matters doesn't that ma okay maybe not my bad y'all camera overheated i know i was talking about the tail light but basically they were finding pieces of the tail lights more of the tail light more and more as the days went on and like the pieces they were finding were getting bigger as the days went on also it's just like a if you find a really big chunk on day three how did you miss that really big chunk on day two i but anyway um so that's why you know knowing that that video is inverted when you're watching it it does in fact matter and there are also like other chunks of the video that just seem to be missing remember i said the video the car being brought in like that chunk of it is missing and then watching the video it's very obvious that this is like chopped up type thing right because one second you'll see someone exiting out of the sally port and then the next clip jumps to like someone being like standing right there next to the car but you don't see the part where that person walks in and he explains it like you know um the the quality of the video is very choppy like it's normal for it to be choppy like that but baby i don't think it's normal for it to be choppy like that okay but other than that two last things from his testimony that i felt stuck out is one he initially told a medical examiner that they were looking at this investigation as if john had gotten into some type of physical altercation and specifically that john had gotten hit in the face with the glass so you remember the glass that he took out of the bar he had told the medical examiner that initially they had thought they were investigating it as if someone had hit john in the face with that glass and remember the injuries that i told you about john he had you know swollen eyes 
um scratches stuff like that he had a laceration to the back of his head and also keep in mind they are saying that karen hit this man with her car this man is 6'2 and her car was going about 20 miles per hour for where a tail light is located he would have had to have been on the ground for some reason for his face to come into contact with the tail light and a tail light coming into contact with someone's face at about 20 miles per hour so much so to the point that it throws them feet 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 y'all know what i'm trying to say over and he lands in a completely different uh location wouldn't wouldn't you initially see the tail light pieces on the floor but that was what he initially said and when asked about that by the defense attorney he said something pretty much like yeah that was you know like the initial theory but with later evidence we we determined that that wasn't the case and the last thing that stuck out about his testimony is that john's clothes were not logged in as evidence until six days after they were collected he said that the clothes were drying off because they were soaking wet when they were collected from the hospital so they spent six days drying and that's probably why they weren't logged in until six days later you know, I be having to go through it with my dryer. I be having to put do that that cycle at least a good three times before my clothes are actually dry. But even if I wasn't going to use a dryer to dry clothes, and I'm talking about the soaking, the soaking wettest of clothes, has never taken six days for a t-shirt and jeans to dry. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up today's video talking about the lead investigator in this case. And y'all let me know in the comments what you think about him by the time I'm done talking, okay, okay. So there's actually a little bit more focus on group chess that he's in before we get into like what actual investigation that he did in this case, if you wanna call it an investigation. So these two group chats, first group chat, he is in a group chat with colleagues. I believe the supervisor that we just discussed is one of the people in this group chat, but like know that this group chat also includes some of his higher ups like the people he reports to right two things that i want to point out he said in this group chat and these are things that he said after he has been given karen's phone because he is the investigator karen gave over her phone because you know she is involved in this case after going through karen's phone one thing that he said is going through the r word so retard that word going through the r word client's phone that's what he called Karen. And another thing he said is no nudes so far. So he claimed he had not found any nudes so far. So her defense attorney is asking, you thought that was appropriate to talk about someone that you're investigating like that, especially investigating, uh, especially in a group chat with like other employees, other law officials. And the only thing he can say is, oh, you know, they were like inappropriate jokes um very bad words that he chose to use but that doesn't change the integrity of the investigation that he did okay so now let's move over to the group chat that had like eight to nine childhood friends someone said is she a babe to which he calls her a cunt oh can i say that can you say y'all y'all get the point um he says she has no ass she is a whack job a oh, personal favorite says she has a leaky balloon knot and not only does she have a leaky balloon knot, but it leaks poop. Okay, baby, when I tell you, he called Karen everything but a child of God in that uh, group chat. And again, he is asked by the defense, like, you think it's appropriate to be talking like that? And mind you, these are personal friends. These are people who have like no involvement whatsoever. Like, it's not like you're texting colleagues about an investigation that they're also working. These are like friends of his asking him questions about this case. Um, you know and the defense is like you think this is appropriate stuff like that blah, blah blah and he's like no it's not appropriate and i'm so ashamed of how i was talking you you really want me to believe that that's the first time he's talked about any any case that he's covering that he's talked about someone if he feels you know that you're beneath him if he feels that you're this that and the third this is the first time that he's talked about someone like that that he's investigating and mind you this is like hours this, this is i think 16 ish hours of him investigating this case and that's already how he's talking about karen and he's like you know that has nothing to do with the integrity of the job that i did on this case doesn't play a role in it whatsoever he also says something to the effect of you know his emotions were high because karen just killed a police officer and you know uh 
he let the disgust that he felt about her like play a role into how he was talking and he's ashamed of that blah 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 blah, blah. so the defense is pretty much like well you had the case wrapped up within like 16 hours and he's like yes within 16 hours he felt he had enough uh, evidence enough information to be so certain and to be so passionate about how he's talking about Karen um, to know that she is the one that was who is responsible for this and there wasn't really much else that he needed before coming to that determination and one last personal thing before talking about the actual investigation that he did at some point he is testifying whether or not like he knows the family that owns the home and remember like the family is it's a big family you know like there, there's a brother that's a cop there's a brother that's an agent there's a brother that's this right and he's test he's testifying on whether or not he know all of these people not just one single person and he's going back and forth between saying he doesn't know them and also that he well he doesn't have a personal a close relationship with them right but of course when you keep doing that digging it comes out that like you're in text messages you're trying to see if one of uh, one of the women in the family can babysit your kids for you he goes to the gym with one of them they go through this whole uh, i don't even know maybe like 10 15 minutes discussing him and one of the brothers like having a night a drunken night out at that so drunk that the brother like left his badge and his gun in his patrol cars and it's, it's like a lot of you a lot of you who have a badge are on the stand admitting that you're going out you're drinking and then you're in you know federal vehicles or you're going back to federal property and then moving vehicles after you've been drinking right but all of that sounds pretty close to me but you know that's up for the jury to decide if that's true or not um but moving forward so now we're talking about the actual investigation that he did right and in these text messages in this one of the group chats that he's in they're talking about the examiner who determined john's cause of death and john's cause of death was actually undetermined like they could not come to a you know like concrete a decision on how it is that he passed away and he's in uh one of these group chats basically say like calling the examiner a whack job he's like insulting the examiner um because he's saying like we gave her all the evidence that she needed to realize that this is a homicide and she still determines that it's undetermined so he's asking him like were you upset about that like were you upset that she didn't determine it was a homicide and he was like no because even because even if an examiner doesn't say the cause of death is what our investigation is saying is the cause of death we still investigate it as that cause of death that we have determined so to make that make sense even if the examiner doesn't say that this is due to a, a homicide his investigation team is still going to investigate the case like it's a homicide so he said he it didn't bother him that she didn't come to that determination but like you're calling her names in these text messages because she didn't come to that conclusion so keep in mind within like 16 17 hours of john being found the investigator says he is sure he knows for a fact that karen is the one that did this even though i just mentioned earlier in this video days after days not just two days not just three days after they are still finding pieces of this tail light the the, the main the, okay wait i don't think i mentioned it in the i did not because someone in the comments said well i'm not sure if i feel like ooh, excuse me karen is guilty or not but her taillight was damaged so how did the taillight get damaged if she didn't hit john so they actually have video footage of karen leaving her place or maybe i think it was john's place because it's his car that's parked there um i'm not sure if it's when she goes to look for him when he doesn't come home but she you see in the video she is backing up and that passenger taillight makes contact with john's car um now you do like it makes enough contact with john's car that john's car moves but it's not like she like rammed into um into his car right which for the people that are saying that karen's taillight was cracked that would explain why karen's taillight would be cracked keep the cracked not fully broken shredded to pieces all of that cracked so with that being one of the ways people are trying to rationalize why karen's car would have some damage to it the investigator who determined within 16 17 hours that karen was guilty and she's the one that did this and there wasn't really much else that he needed to see he actually does take a photo of john's car that shows there was no damage to his car because on video she does hit his car but you know what he didn't do he didn't take a picture 
of Karen's taillight initially, at the same time, to show that there was damage on her taillight, right? Because if Karen had hit John at the time that they're saying she hit him, at the time that she backed up into John's car, it should have already been totaled. Like the taillight should have already been broken into pieces. So when you took that picture, you should have taken a picture of Karen's car as well, but you didn't. You don't actually get like up close pieces of the taillight stuff like that until after her car makes it into that Sally port. Also with these text messages that the lead investigator was sending off, baby, you should have gotten rid of your phone like everybody else did. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why everyone else knew to get rid of their phones, but the person, had, the lead investigator, you didn't think that you should get rid of your phone too? I mean, good thing that you didn't because we wouldn't know a lot of this, but um, he actually texted in one of those group chats that he too thought that John had been in some type of physical altercation and that that's how they were investigating this. Like at first, that's what he, so at first he had also initially said that there was some type of fight with John, um, but then later on says, the investigation that they did is what changed their minds and they realized that John had actually not been in a fight, but I don't know, that's two people. That's two people investigating this who initially said that there was some type of physical altercation that John was in. And then all of a sudden the evidence said, nope, nope, he was hit by a car. And again, there was a laceration to the back of his head. There were no injuries below his neck, no broken bones, no bruises. Again, so your body is flying, it lands, it, the impacts from, you know, 5,000, 6,000 uh, pound car hitting you, there's no bruises, no, nothing like that. There's just scratches and those puncture wounds. Remember I told y'all they got rid of the dog. And the last thing about this investigation that, you know, he had wrapped up in 16 to 17 hours and he knew exactly who did it, all of that stuff, right? Um, again, the actual home where the body was found was never investigated on the inside because they claimed they had no, like, no reason to believe it was done on the inside. Even though something very interesting that the defense pointed out, not with this, uh, witness, someone else, but, um, he pointed out we're in the middle of winter. There is a snowstorm going on. John is found with only one shoe. Um, you know, you know, the way he's dressed, it's not dressed for a blizzard, anything like that. Y'all are claiming you had no reason to look on the inside of the house, but like nothing would have said to you, maybe I should check the inside of the house to see if any of his stuff is on the inside, you know, like any winter uh, wear, you know, coats, the other shoe, anything like that. Like nothing told you, maybe I should look on the inside of the house because if you find it, in, in the inside of the house that would suggest he was inside the house and everyone is telling you he never stepped foot inside the house that would sound like an, uh, a contradiction to me but you know so just amazing investigative skills got the case closed within 16 to 17 hours however a lot of these people were not interviewed until weeks months a year later literally some of these people were not interviewed until 16 to 18 months later including the snowplow driver so remember there's a snowstorm going on outside and they had claimed that no one had plowed the street um during this time frame but there's a snowplow driver who claims he did plow the street i think somewhere around like 2 a.m and he claims when he plowed the street he didn't see anybody on the street and re remember john is 6'2 um would be hard to miss uh, and you know, uh, think of a plow. He's, he's, I think if I'm plow, I'm seeing the snow go, I would have seen a body on the street. He claims he did not see a body. And there is one more person I just want to squeeze in there because it was really short and to the point with him so much so that the defense didn't even bother to cross examine him because you don't really have to cross examine someone that helps you prove your point, right? He is a detective and he actually went with the lead investigator and the supervisor that I had mentioned earlier to retrieve Karen's car. He said they went in and they were talking with, you know, Karen and her family for like 30, 40 minutes and he kind of like stayed outside. And the only important, well, the main important important thing that he testifies is that while he was outside he looked at Karen's car and that right tail light he says was cracked he said it was not completely damaged it was cracked it was missing like a piece or two but it was not completely damaged and that there was just snow around the vehicle so like 
we're not seeing broken pieces of tail light on the floor. It was just snow and the tail light was just cracked. So that is the wrap up of the testimony that I have seen since the last video that I posted. Like I said, I think I'm missing a day or two, something like that, baby. They're saying this case isn't supposed to be over until like late June. So we got about another two weeks. Y'all gonna have to bear with me, okay? I'm watching it in real time. I'm gonna give you the wrap ups, but um, I had to come give this one because I've been getting comments like, girl, what's next? Where's the next part? Um, so let me know in the comments down below what you think about what is actually being testified about the words that are actually coming out of these people's mouths. Let me know about that down below. However, let's scoot over to the conspiracy side of this case and y'all know the conspiracy here and also what the defense is alleging is that this is a cover up job, right? And one of the things I keep seeing are, uh, is people saying, why would this many people be dedicated to covering this up? So you mean to tell me like 40 people are trying to do a cover up job, blah, 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 blah. There are a couple reasons on why be also effing for real, okay? Is water wet? One, they all know each other. It'd be harder to convince me that this many people would be dedicated if we're talking about strangers, right? Strangers who just come together to work on the case uh, at the same time. Yeah, it'd be a little harder to convince me that. But these are all people that know each other. This person's babysitting, this person's children, this person was on the Pee Wee football, this person, they go to get drinks, they go to the same gym, they go play golf. Yeah, if if your friends are involved, you probably are more willing to, to help them. Also, um, if you help your friends, you now get yourself involved, you'd have a reason of why you're trying to brush this under the rug. Like the, like the officer who kind of admitted to committing a felony by getting his best friend involved, by the friend teaching him how to get the text messages out of his phone. Even the judge on this case was asked to recuse herself because her brother was a lawyer for one of the brothers of the homeowner. Remember I said they were all like police officers. I guess he had gotten into like a DUI situation, something like that, and the person that he, his car hit uh, passed away. So the, the judge's brother was able to get him like probation six months something like that but like even the judge is somehow connected to these people everyone knows each other and another thing a lot of the people involved were in that house that night because remember it's like an after party get together type thing if you are included by being at the scene of the crime you're more likely to have a reason why you're kind of trying to brush this under the rug think about it when there's like a shooting that happens right and there's so many people there it's like here there there everybody's there what do you hear the the victim's family say um, when you see them speaking out about it right one of the things they say is you mean to tell me all these people were there and like no one knows what's happening no one saw anything no one can come up with any information why do people that are there not speak out especially in like that type of situation if you've been watching that ysl case which that's a whole other story um a lot of the reasons people don't speak out one they don't want to get themselves involved two you know snitches get stitches right so you you don't want to speak out because you don't you fear of retaliation and in this case is retaliation of a whole bunch of people that work in law enforcement and if you think about it you kind of need more people to participate in a cover-up for a cover-up to actually at least attempt to be successful if you only have one person who's willing to be shady then you have more people who are more willing to be honest and will you know expose the person who's trying to who's trying to cover something up but if you have more people who are willing to turn a blind eye or you know teach you how to do things on company time or let you know that a subpoena is coming before the subpoena actually comes you need more people to do that for it to at least attempt to be successful look at some of the other cover-ups out there i think right now i don't remember where the police state i don't remember where the department is, I think maybe Mississippi, but there is one that is being investigated right now for allegedly uh, trying to help uh, one cover up the fact that he is a serial essayer. And I'm talking like 52 women who have claims against him. And mind you, I'm using the word women, but that case also involves children in there as well. Do you know how many people would have to be involved for 52 women? to talk about the fact that they have tried to get justice and it's gone uncovered, all of that type of stuff. Do you know how many people would have to be involved in that? Even that um, little black boy, it was it was in Georgia, right? The one that they found uh, in the gym mats. You remember uh, his family came out and I think even right now, like they are currently suing um, the department because they were like, oh, he accidentally fell in there and you know, um, 
suffocated and that's how he ended up passing away and his family was like no no there are so many other there are little stories here about people that he had issues with and those people were connected to law enforcement so going off of what the parents say right because i don't know if you guys know but that they ruled a couple years ago they were like officially closing that case but like the parents are not giving up but if we are going with what the parents are saying and it is a cover-up right do you understand how many people would have to be involved in that cover-up for it to have been a successful cover-up you would have had to have school administrators uh the people investigating other police uh or law enforcement uh other students other family members because people talk students talk children talk so many people that would know what actually happened to to kendrick that's his name and not say anything and are we acting like we don't know that cover-up attempts exist now look is it a cover-up I don't know is it giving cover up yes but let's just say that karen actually did do it let's say it's not a cover up and karen actually did do it she actually did hit him and karen ends up getting off because let's let's remember here it's technically not her defense's job to prove that she didn't do it it's their job to put in enough reasonable doubt to the jury that they cannot find her guilty 100 percent it's actually the state's job to make sure that when the jury goes back there to deliberate they're like yes absolutely positively if you watch that daryl brooks case everybody and their mama knew but as soon as you sit down he is guilty send that ooh, send him to jail okay that is the state's job is to make sure there's no reasonable doubt when i tell you this thing is filled with reasonable doubt if she is guilty and she ends up like if she actually did do it but she is found not guilty they have no one to blame but the state and the investigators who handled the case because of the way that they handled the case or the way that they didn't because maybe you didn't you, everything that you have heard now from the steps that they didn't take the things that they didn't do to secure the 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 scene to investigate everything you, you chose not to investigate the house connected to the land where his body was found everything that they did not do for this case if she if she did do it and she ends up getting away that is who you have to blame and it's crazy because this is, involves a police officer and we know the time that they are more more likely to actually do the job correctly is when it involves a police officer you know he's saying he's talking about her that way in the text messages because she killed a police officer and because he's just so upset stuff like that you, you could have fooled me with the way you all chose to handle this investigation pieces blowing god knows where with your leaf blower um the clothes done sat out for six days before being entered as evidence if she if she does and if she did do it and she gets off you have no one to blame but yourself which then leads people to question why on earth would you handle the situation the way that you did it's kind of similar to the thug case if you're following that i foresee that case going two ways and both of those ways lead to thug getting off and it's not necessarily because he didn't do what they're claiming that he did it's the way that the case uh is being presented it's the way that the case is being handled and at the end of the day you really don't have anyone to blame but yourself for that so that's the same that's the same way that i see it for this karen case like i said i don't know if she did it and the thing is you're not really proving that she did it there are too many holes in your story there's too much reasonable doubt there and that would be the fault of the state and the um and the investigators however i keep seeing that um just like the fbi is looking into the officer that assaulted those women i keep hearing it i keep seeing it but like i tried to google it to see if i could find any information on that and i haven't but apparently the fbi is looking into this investigation as well so it's giving hopefully what we're gonna find out what happened how is the question so that is it for this video y'all i know it's a long one um i at some point have forgotten what i was even talking about let me know in the comments down below what you think about this case and yeah i will see you in the next recap and the next update bye